All right. This is where it gets complicated. If it wasn't complicated enough, this is where it gets complicated. We have talked about selectors and how the selector helps you find the particular tag in the document that you want to apply a style to. We have talked about location. It can be right there on the tag, it can be in that file, or it can be in an external file, or it can be in several files. Each of these three locations, I can specify the same rule. I can be saying my paragraph should be 12 point font, or 14 point font, or 0 font, or whatever. I have multiple rules in all these different locations. Well, how do I decide? What is, how am I going to actually render a particular piece of text? I have paragraph rules that say, in general, my body has 12 point font. Oh, but my paragraphs have 10 point font. Oh, but in a table, my paragraphs have 9 point font. This is all sorted out by something called the cascade. That's what the cascading style sheet refers to. There's three aspects to the cascade. And as you see on your handout, they are inheritance, specificity, and location. Inheritance, specificity, and location. Now, if you take a look at the document object model, you know that the document object model has a nested structure. So let's, you can see it here using Firebug. And the nesting is shown by these little um, expansion icons and the um, indentation. So here's the head and the body. Within the body, the next layer down is this H1 and P1 pair. There's also a, an unordered list. Inside the unordered list, there are list elements. And there's a structure. This is inside of this. This is inside of this. This is inside of this, which is inside of this, which is inside of this. So there's a nice nested um, structure. Um, this tool that I love, although it's not really as useful, lets you see that structure differently. So you can see the body, let's see if I can zoom in on that. The body is represented by this slice here. Actually, no, that's the page. That's the HTML. The body, you can see over here, this color is this rectangle here. The head one, the H1 tag, is here. The paragraph is here. The unordered list is this box here. And then each list element is this box here. Notice that I said earlier that everything's a box. That tilt tool shows you the boxes. Firebug shows you the boxes. The yellow part is the margin. If there happens to be uh, padding, you would see it inside the blue part. So the first thing is if I'm inside here, if I'm here, I inherit the styles from the thing I'm inside. So if I don't tell it I want this paragraph to look any different, it's going to use the same styles it uses in the thing that contains it, the, uh, the, list, item, the list item. If it doesn't have any other rules, doesn't know how it's supposed to do a list item, it'll use whatever style it's using in the, the UL tag that contains it. So you're always just inheriting your, your styles in the same way you inherit the eye color of your kind of hair you have from the people who came before you. It's exactly that kind of inheritance. And it all gets inherited from the body tag. As we said earlier, every browser has a built-in style sheet. So unless you tell it otherwise, the browser has a set of rules for every tag. And it'll apply them if you tell it 
if you don't bother to say, I want this kind of style, the browser will apply its own little style sheet. I don't know of a way where you can display the browser style sheet, but using Firebug, you can show how it is deciding all of its styles by looking at the computed tab here. This is all of the properties that an HTML element can have. Every one of them. And the browser has calculated the property for every one of these elements. And you can see as I click on each one of them, the properties for those elements are changing. The other thing Firebug will do for you, which is very cool, and you've seen this before in class, is it will take all of the rules in all of the various locations and it will display them for you so that you can see why the browser is choosing to render something in this, in this style. So um, there are two H1 rules somewhere in this system probably on the page and probably in an external style sheet. The one that is inside the HTML file is the one that is actually being used. The one that's in the external style sheet is being ignored. You can tell because it's got this line through it. Talk about why that's true in a second. So the first part of the cascade to review, the first part of the cascade is um, <coughs> inheritance. It uses the document object model. You don't specify the style for tagging. The browser will look at the containers all the way up to find a style. The next part of the cascade is specificity, and that has to do with the selector. The more specific you, you define that rule, the more it sticks. So, for example, if you put that style right in the tag, it doesn't matter what other rules exist that might affect that tag, that style applies, because it's right there in the tag, and it is specific to that tag. So if you've got black text someplace else, and you want that particular paragraph to be red, you can put style, font color equals red, colon red, it'll apply. What's the next most specific thing? Well, I could name that tag with an ID. There's only one of those on every page. So that's the next most specific thing. And then it works its way out. Classes are next specific. And then just the element itself is the most general thing there. I'm not exactly sure what a universal selector is. But basically, well, I just don't know. I'm not going to say anything if I can't say anything. So this means if I've got two rules that might affect this same tag, the browser will take the one that is most specific, and that rule wins. Related to that is location. Now one way you can think of it is the rule that's closer to the tag is the one that wins. If I've got two or more rules that overlap, try to make this particular thing different colors, different fonts. If I have two rules that might apply, the one that's closer wins. We saw that already. If I put a style uh, attribute in the tag itself, well, that's right there. That wins automatically. It's the closest thing. If I've got a rule that's in the file, well, that's closer, if you will, than any rule that's in some external file. External file. So stuff inside the file wins if there's an overlap. The stuff in an external file will be applied if there's no conflicting rule inside or in the tag, internal or inline. Now, if I listed, again, think, I've got a tag down here. I've got a couple of links. I've got two files. They each have a conflicting rule in which one wins? The first one I list or the second one? Which one's closer? The second one. The second one. The second one. I'm 
Another way to think about this is I'll do what the I'll do the thing that you told me last. If anyone has little kids or little brothers, you know the last thing you tell them is usually what they'll do. The browser is no smarter. So it pulls in that first external file and it reads all the rules it's designed on it right to this page. Yes, cool. Whoa, then it gets another file and there's conflicting rules. It says, oh, okay, well I'll do it this way. Well, it actually brings in the HTML file, it gets another set of rules, it says, oh, okay, well I'll do it this way then. And then finally it gets to that tag and there's some style there, it says, oh, fine, 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 I'll do it this way. So you can either think of it in terms of proximity, the style rule that's closest is the one that wins, or you can think of it in terms of the last thing I read was the one that won. Yes. So let's say you have an external style sheet set up with you know, your, your base configuration. So then you inline something for a little piece of a paragraph because you decide you want to change it to italics or different font and all yep. this other stuff. When you end that paragraph, does it then go back to the one in the external? Yep. Okay. So these style things have a scope. They have an area which they pertain to. So the scope for an uh, inline style is that tag. Is that tag right? The scope for the file, the internal style rules is that tag. And then finally, there's this important directive, which frankly I don't really understand all the details around it. But you can tell, you can put this in an external file, and it will override the rules we just described. So if you've got some style, for example, places where you'll see this is branding. Um, like if you look at Coke's pages, there's a specific color red. There's only one color red in the entire world that you can use for a code logo. They have a very strong brand. And I haven't seen their style sheets, but I would bet that there's a style rule in there for anything that pertains to the code logo. And you can't override it. If you're a web designer, you aren't allowed to change the color of the logo. So, what this cascade does for you is it gives you the flexibility of saying, well, I can, I can have a bunch of different situations. And in those different situations, I want the stuff to appear different ways. But it's a good, clean set of rules that allow you to understand how it works. Now, in practice, what happens is you end up with a lot of cascading style sheets. Uh, by a lot, I mean five or six. It doesn't sound like a lot. But pretty soon you've got rules and you don't know why. You've got a web page and you don't know why it looks the way it does. It just, and you can't control it. It drives you nuts. I'm speaking from experience. I talked, uh, there's a company here called Jive Software. Uh, very cool company. If you ever get a chance to work with Jive, I would recommend it. I was talking to one of their front end designers. He was saying they have style sheets that are thousands of lines long. Some of their web pages pull in 10 or 15 of these style sheets. You know, it's just incredible. You have a, a large site that's been under development for many years, you end up with a lot of these files. So it will be useful to you to remember these simple rules. The closer I am, the rule applies. The more specific I am, the rule applies. Then get yourself some decent minimum is, is Firebug. You can see here that Firebug will tell you this, basically the browser has to do this anyway. Firebug just shows you the way the browser is thinking about it. It isn't unusual for you to come out with five or six of the same selectors, most of which are, are, are not applying at this moment. So in this particular example, I've got, let's see, what have I got going here? This particular example, and I've got something that looks like this. I'm going to open it with that notepad plus So I've got a real simple, can you guys see that? I've got a real simple paragraph, <coughs> one heading, I've got a paragraph, I've got an unordered list, some list elements in it. There's no stuff.
style information in here at all. No style information in here at all. I've got some style up here. This is inside the uh, HTML file. Notice this, these are comment delimiters. The comment delimiters in Cascading Style Sheets look like the comment delimiters in C or any one of those functional languages. You can also use double slashes up in front if you like that kind of stuff. Anyway, and I've also got a link to an external style sheet. Let's take a look at that external style sheet. <coughs> the external style sheets are very simple. Now you'll notice the style I'm using here is pretty simple. Now you could, I'm using uh, four spaces. The other way I've seen people do this style is like this. You always put the opening brace on the same line as the selector. You always put the closing brace on the line by itself. If you found more than Notice I said earlier you should make these things in an alphabetical order, and I'm not following my own direction. So I'm going to fix that. And I'm going to clean up my indentation. I am not requiring you to follow this style in this class, but you should. You'll notice the, the style I gave you was horrible. It was all in the same thing. I don't know if you can read that or not. So here's an external style sheet, pretty simple. Paragraphs, I want to green, unless the paragraph is inside a list element, in which case I want it red. Notice I'm not saying I want the list item red. I'm saying I want a paragraph. If I happen to put a paragraph inside a list item, I want it red. Like it's a pull quote or something like that. If I've got a header level one, I want it to be blue, and I want that box to be a See, if this is R, and G, and B, I've got more B than I've got R or G, so it's going to be a slightly blue tint. Since these are all pretty high, FF is the highest number I can put here, that's 255. This is going to be all the blue that I can fit on that little pixel, a little less red and green. So this should be a pretty light blue. And what do you know? That's exactly what we end up with. I got a heading level up here. When I look at the heading level one, my background color is, and Firebug is nice enough that if you hover over a color string, it'll actually show you the color. It's kind of cool. The text color is blue, the background is light blue. Here's my paragraph outside of a list. The style that applies is coming from my external file. Here's my paragraph inside the list. I've got three different rules that apply to paragraphs. Three different rules. I've got that one rule that says uh, paragraphs by themselves should be green, but that doesn't apply anymore because I'm more specifically saying I have a paragraph inside a list item. My external style sheet wants me to make those things red. My internal style sheet agrees with it, but it's the internal style sheet rule that we're so this is the most specific rule, and it's the closest one to this tag, so we will use. Cool. Let's make a little change, see if we can mess this up. So my external style sheet is saying green. My internal style sheet says paragraph should be blue, but it's commented out. Let's remove that, and let's put that rule into place. So now I want to have paragraphs that are otherwise unspecified. I want them to be blue. So I'm going to go out to my browser, reload the page. There's my reload button up there. I said I'm going to reload the page. <coughs> Did I save that file? I thought I didn't save it. Save it there. There we go. Now I'm going to reload the page. Paragraph is now blue. Because that's closer to the tag.
internal rule says make it blue. The external rule says green. Internal trumps external everything. It may seem like it's uh, a trivial thing, and for this size of an example, it's pretty trivial. If I wanted to make this paragraph so, let's say it was yellow, and I wanted to override both of these rules, where would I put it? Tag itself. And then tag itself. Let's see if that. See if I can do this. Wow, new crop teaching. This is crazy. Don't do it, Al. Don't do it. I'm going to do it. So what's the uh, syntax for that? Style equals, equals open and close it at the same time so I don't forget. And then it's what? Um, color. Color yellow. Probably the most unreadable color on the face of the planet. Let's style. Let's save that. Switch back. Reload. You can read that. You've got better eyes than we do. But here's the element style. Notice it says element dot style. It's saying the style that's actually on the element itself is telling me that its color should be yellow. And then here's the cascade itself. On the tag, internal, then external. Okay, so for your assignment this week, uh, you got to take your style sheets from inside the thing, from outside. I think there's some extra credit. There might be some extra credit around floats. Floats are real cool. Floats are the way that you can make a style, uh, make a, a layout like this that flexes. If you say, in general, I want this on the left side and I want this on the right side, you use float. Then if the screen gets too small, it'll just move. It'll move them so that it can display. Floats can be hard to handle because especially as you nest things, there are some pretty obscure rules for how the float bubbles up, how the inheritance on the float works. So we're just going to float one thing. Um, that's worth a couple extra points. You've got another network diagram. This one has multiple protocols. It's got a token ring. It's got a couple of subnets. It's got a couple of local area networks. Make sure you connect those using the right devices. Also, um, the big thing on a network diagram is you got to show me the connections. Show me all the connections, even if it seems trivial to you. I mean, uh, some people didn't show me the connection between the internet and their modem. Well, why would I have a modem if not to connect to the internet? I mean, duh. But, you've got to show me the connections. I mean, it's like wiring up a house and forgetting to connect it to the power grid. I mean, I know we've all had contractors who've done that, but don't say it's an electricity bill. It's an electricity bill. All right, any questions about cascading style sheets? All right. This is really tough stuff. Because, as with all programming, you make a change somewhere, and it, and it has an effect. And in your head, you have to connect those two things. That's the whole thing about programming, is you change some code, or something else changes, and you don't see them. And some people never get past that. Some people are really connected. And if they were a sculptor, they would want to actually work the material themselves. Some people make great carpenters, and terrible architects. Some people make great testers and terrible programmers. One of the things I'd like you to do experience in this class is that, that, that way of thinking. I make a change way over here, and it has this effect way over here. And, and see how that feels. If you like that feeling, I think it's kind of natural. You know, I make a change in the recipe and the, the cake bakes itself. I think that's kind of cool. Where you make a change and something goes wrong, now you got to figure it out. I'm less enamored with debugging, but there's something about making something work that I really enjoy. And that's why I'm most of you can. If you like that kind of thing, you might enjoy programming. If you like this kind of thing, you might enjoy web design. If you're a really good web designer, you code your CSS by hand. You code your HTML by hand. If you're uh, I shouldn't say that. If you're a really good front-end designer, 
Because I know some, some really good web designers who just know Photoshop. They're just all visual. And they, they move things around. They have no idea how it actually gets implemented. They have no idea how the browser works. And that's great. But if you're the person who's actually coding up HTML and CSS, you do it by right hand. You can start with Dreamweaver or any of the other tools. But you know how everything works. It's like if you're a race car mechanic, like my son, you know what every piece does on that car. And you've probably replaced it a few times. One more. One more. He pulled all of the wiring out of his car last week. Everything that didn't make it go fast, he pulled it out. It was like it was like a horror movie where someone grabbed your esophagus and ripped your lungs out. And it was 20 pounds of wire. Did you cut the computer door panels out yet? Oh man, they went long ago. Did I tell you that story where he took me for a ride in his car? I think I told you guys. He took me for a ride in his car. He had ripped out his door panels. He had ripped out all the lining. There are bolts sticking everywhere, including one right here. <laughs> and he's got this wonderful Recaro seat, you know, bucket seat fitted to him. He's got a five, five point harness. We're just, boom, boom, just going down the street. I'm flying, flying, I'm flying against everything. And everything looks dangerous, and I don't have anything to hold on to. He had, he had nothing. He, he later replaced these with grab handles, and he's got a roll cage. Anyway, I was flying through these corners, and I'm flying back and forth because I don't know if I want to. And I said, Dad, what do I hold on to? I'm, I'm going to die here. He says, Dad, grab your ass and shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? Actually, it works pretty well. You know, 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 you know